So my name's Ewan, I'm from University of Glasgow, and like you've just said, we're going to talk about Do That There. So, when users want to use mid-air gestures to interact with something, one of the first things they have to do is find where to perform their gestures. If they don't gesture in a place where the sensors can see them, then their actions are going to have no effect on the device. So the image there shows an example of how that may happen. The user wants to gesture towards their phone on the coffee table, but their hand isn't within the sensor space for that device. Unlike other types of input, like touchscreen input or keyboard input, the mid-air gesture sensing has a bit of a more vague and ambiguous boundary between when users are interacting with the system and not interacting with the system. Also, uncertainty about where the sensors are located and what they can see can add to this problem. Now that more devices and technologies are able to sense gestures and movement, there's also the problem of having many devices within the same space sensing input at the same time. In this situation, shown by the image there, there's also the chance that the user's gestures will be sensed by more than just the device that they want to interact with. And also, um, there's the risk of ordinary movements being treated as gestures unintentionally. So for example, if the person in the image there was to reach forward and pick up their phone, there's the chance that their TV, for example, might think that that was a gesture. So these are problems that occur when users address mid-air gesture systems. Addressing a gesture system is when you initiate interaction with it, and it's the first step of the interaction, which happens before users actually do anything to control the system. As mentioned in the previous slides, three usability problems that might occur at this stage are the user gesturing in the wrong place, gestures affecting the wrong system, and ordinary movements having unintended effects on a device. And those last two are more commonly known as the Midas touch problem. So one way to overcome these problems is by giving users feedback. A common way of doing this is to visualize what the sensors can see on screen, like shown there. So the user might see something like a silhouette of their hand or their, a silhouette of their body, which they can use to adapt how they gesture. So for example, if they weren't gesturing in a very good place, then they might move their position in front of the sensor so that their movements are more likely to be picked up. But what about devices that are unable to give users that same level of feedback? Rich sensing capabilities are being added to increasingly smaller devices, devices like mobile phones and small household objects. And they have small screens or no screen at all on which to give users feedback. So in the case of mobile phones, for example, we can interact with them using gestures, but we already struggle to fit good interfaces on those small screens. Information there is already quite cluttered, so providing even more is just going to add to that problem. Also, those small screens might be difficult to see from quite far away. Household interfaces and devices might also have small screens or no screen on which to give feedback, so we need to think of another way to do that. Mm -hmm. So we investigated interactions for address and gesture systems, focusing on devices like these with limited display capabilities. But the interaction techniques could also be used by pretty much any mid-air gesture system using TVs or large displays, for example. So we considered the use of interactive light feedback. This uses simple light sources to display information. These could be small lights embedded in devices, like the mobile phone shown on the left there, or they could be separate light sources, like the lamp shown on the right. This approach allows devices to illuminate the area surrounding them, creating ad hoc displays for giving feedback. In the case of mobile phones, this keeps the screen free for showing content, feedback can be shown over a much larger area surrounding the device. For simple objects with no display at all, this allows visual feedback to be given when that would otherwise be impossible. We also considered using tactile feedback. So tactile feedback during mid-air gestures can be challenging because the user doesn't actually contact the device that they're gesturing at. So we use fiber tactile feedback from wearable devices, devices like smart watches or activity trackers, which have this capacity, which we could use to provide information during other interactions. Finally, we also used audio feedback because it's an easy output modality to provide in terms of technical challenges. So we developed an interaction technique called Do That There, which can overcome some of the usability problems which I spoke about earlier and it uses the three types of output which I just mentioned. This interaction has two parts, do that, which tells users how to direct their input towards the system, and there, which helps them find where to perform the gestures. 
I'll now talk about each part separately, starting with there, and then bring them both together later on. So the there interaction helps users find where to perform gestures so that their input can be sensed more reliably. It does this by giving users feedback, which tells them how well they can be seen by the sensors. So for camera-based systems, this might be better when the user is closer to the centre of the field of view and also at an appropriate distance from the sensor. This type of feedback also lets the user know that they can be sensed and that the system is tracking them and paying attention to them. So we use brightness of light to show users how well they could be seen, with the light becoming brighter as they gestured in a better position. Audio and tactile feedback used a Geiger counter metaphor, with repeated tones becoming more frequent as they approach a better position for performing input. These designs map just one dimension of information to feedback, so it doesn't give explicit instruction or spatial cues like move left or move closer. So the idea is that the users have to explore the space themselves and form their own understanding of how to have more successful interactions. The paper has more details about how we arrived at these designs. So our first study evaluated this feedback to see how effective it was for guiding users. We did this using a targeting task where participants had to find target points positioned over a mobile phone. LEDs around the edge of the phone gave light feedback with tactile cues being delivered through an actuator worn on the wrist. Audio feedback came from a loudspeaker. So we looked at each of those feedback types separately as well as after combinations. The target task, as shown in the video there, was that users had to explore the space over the phone using an extended input finger, using the feedback to guide them towards the targets, and when they thought they'd found that, they used their other hand to press a button to end the task. So we found that users could locate points with 51 millimeters accuracy, we found that feedback modality had an impact on that accuracy with better performance in conditions that included audio feedback. At the same time, these conditions were also slower than those without audio. When light feedback was given, accuracy was not as high as with audio, but the interactions were quicker. And performance was best when these types of feedback were combined. So some participants explained that they would use the different types of feedback for different things, using the light to initially position their hand before honing in using the audio or tactile feedback. So next we looked at the do that part of the interaction. This tells users how to direct their input towards a particular system or device. This helps to overcome the Midas touch problem because the user shows which system they want to interact with and also shows their intention to interact. As an example of why that's necessary, the image there shows how multiple devices might be sensing input from the same space, potentially all of them acting upon any movements that the user makes. By directing input towards one system in particular, the others know that any actions that follow are not intended for them. So with this interaction, users direct their input using something which we call rhythmic gestures. Rhythmic gestures are gestures that are repeated in time with a rhythm, shown using an animation. And those animations might be shown using something like the LED display shown on the previous slides, or they could also be shown on screen if that was available. By combining different hand movements with different movement speeds, we can create quite a large design space just from a few simple gestures. So we chose five hand movements for the gestures shown on the screen there. That was waving the hand from side to side, moving up and down, forwards and backwards, and moving in a circular path. We also selected four speeds for those gestures, which gave us a total of 20 gestures. So by assigning different movements and speeds to different devices, users could direct their input towards one by performing the appropriate gesture. For example, if they wanted to direct their input towards the mobile phone there, they'd move their hand from side to side in time with the animation as it moves across the table. Effectively, users are using this to make a selection. These are examples of what the animations might look like if we were using a simple circular LED display around the dial. Basically, the movement of the light shows users the movement that they need to make as well as the speed at which they need to replicate that movement at. So our second study evaluated how well users could actually perform this type of gesture. We wanted to see if they'd be able to move in time with the animations and at different speeds, and we were also interested in what role feedback had on their gesture performance. So we gave four types of feedback about gestures. One just used the LED animations to show them how to move. The other three gave additional audio and tactile feedback, which was basically given a short tone or a sound at the end of each part of that individual gesture. The details about how we came to that is in the paper as well. So the task in this experiment was to match a rhythmic gesture 
which means to perform the correct gesture in time with the animation for a minimum period of time. That was approximately three full movements in sync with the animation. We gave users a limited amount of time in which to complete each task, and we measured the success rate of that, how long it took them, and we also got them to give difficulty ratings for that as well. Unlike in the previous experiment, we used a wall-mounted circular LED with a connect for gesture sensing. So, users performed almost all rhythmic gestures successfully. The success rate was 93%. Success was varying across gesture, movement, and tempo. There's a paper being presented tomorrow by another group called PathSync, which presents a similar interaction technique, and they got very similar success rates as well, which I thought was quite interesting. In our study, the two circular gestures performed poorly, especially at the fastest movement speeds, which are highlighted in red. In contrast, the side-to-side -side and up-and-down gestures were performed the best with almost 100% completion rate. In the PathSync paper, they also found that circular movements were not performed as well as more rectangular trajectories, so there might be an interesting reason for that. Generally, rhythmic gestures with the slower movement speeds were more successful, with the success rate decreasing as the gestures got faster. The results showed that feedback had no effect on gesture success, so participants didn't perform any differently when given non-visual feedback about their movements. So users took just over two seconds to match each gesture, with times there normalised to the 500 millisecond interval. <coughs> feedback had no effect on time, but as the graph shows, interval and movement did. So gestures with shorter intervals or faster movement speeds took longer to complete, with the most noticeable difference with the shorter interval there. The circular ones, also highlighted in red, took longer to complete than the other three movements. So finally, we combined the two interactions into one technique called Do That There. Finding where to gesture and direct an input, at the same, uh, direct an input towards a system can happen at the same time, and the interaction would be quite cumbersome and time-consuming if users had to do these separately. More experienced users are also more likely to know where to perform gestures for a system, so they could just skip this step and go straight to directing their input instead. So if the combined technique users gesture to direct their input while also using the feedback from the system to adapt where they're gesturing so that they can be more accurately sensed. As the video shows there, the gesture animation changes in brightness based on where the user is moving their hands. So when the, feed, when the animation's at its brightest, it's because they're gesturing in a good position. So each of the interactions has its own, different, uh, has its own feedback, which could be combined in different ways. One option is to just give both types of feedback and all modalities at the same time. So with this, the gesture animations would be brighter when users gesture in a good space and more difficult to see when they're gesturing in a bad place. The audio and the tactile feedback could be delivered at the same time as well. An alternative to this is to use different modalities for different types of information. So since light is needed to show the rhythmic gesture animations for direct and input, we could use audio or haptic cues instead to help users find where to gesture using the feedback which we used in the first experiment. So we looked at this design problem in the final study, which I'll go on to in a second. Another design question when designing these techniques is how much feedback do users actually need to tell them where to gesture? So once users have actually started performing gestures and have started to interact with a the system, they might not benefit from having this extra feedback which tells them where to gesture. Instead, it might be sufficient to stop giving that feedback once a gesture is in progress. So with these questions in mind, we came up with five feedback designs. They're explained in more detail in the paper to save time. These designs would allow us to investigate two questions in our final study. The first is, how should we present two types of feedback using multiple output modalities? So should we combine that across them or divide the information between the two? And do users benefit from feedback telling them where to gesture all of the time during the interaction, or would it be sufficient to stop that once they start to perform them? So our third study investigated how well users could use this interaction technique, as well as investigating the effect of the different feedback designs mentioned before. This was basically a combination of the past two studies, so users had to match a rhythmic gesture while also performing it as close to a target point as possible. There are two factors in this study, which are feedback and gesture. So we chose the two best gestures from the last study, which were moving the hand from side to side and moving the hand up and down. And we had those performed at the 700 millisecond movement speed because that did quite well before. 
So in this experiment, users matched 99.9% uh, of gestures, which is similar to the completion rate for those gestures in the previous study. They also gestured within 80 millimetres of the target point. It took them just under four seconds to find the target point and complete a gesture, and that four seconds includes just over two seconds spent matching the gesture animation. Interaction times were the lowest when the feedback was combined across modalities. This might have been because the visual feedback directly affected the visibility of the gesture animations, so that might have had a more noticeable effect when users were trying to follow that. So, for example, that means that if your hand was in a bad position, the animation would be more difficult to see, so it compels users to find that space before they actually start to provide the input. We also found that users did not necessarily benefit from getting feedback which tells them where to perform gestures all of the time. So the highlighted results there show the designs where the feedback stopped once a gesture started. It wasn't that much different to the other designs where it's given throughout the entire interaction. So in summary, or do that their interaction seemed to be successful, users completed almost all of the gestures and they did so within 80 millimetres of the target points in that third study. That's quite good considering that they were gesturing with quite large arm movements from the opposite side of the room, several metres away. Interaction time is good as well. Users found where to gesture and matched the correct gesture within about four seconds. That is, they were able to address the system within four seconds. In terms of feedback design, we found that it was better to combine feedback across all of the modalities, rather than giving different types of information from different ones. This seems to have come down to the more noticeable effect of the light feedback on the animations, as I mentioned before. We also found that we could stop giving feedback telling users where to perform gestures once they had started providing input. So to conclude, users need to address mid-air gesture systems so that their input can be sensed and so that their gestures only affect the system they intend to interact with. In this paper, we present Do That There, which is a technique for addressing mid-air gesture systems. This can be used by a variety of system form factors without needing a screen for feedback. This means that it can be used by typical gesture systems with large displays, as well as emerging gesture systems like mobile phones, small objects, or in-car interfaces. Devices which are more limited in their ability to provide feedback, but which increasingly have richer sensing capabilities. Thank you. Any questions? Hi, uh, thank you for the informative talk. Uh, this is Kai from UMBC. Um, I noticed between study one and study two, you went from uh, a single fi uh, finger gesture to an arm or a whole hand. Yeah. Uh, did you see any reduction in accuracy from the, the single finger, which uh, required you to go to a larger area in terms of the whole hand for gesturing? No. So the reason we looked at those different types of gesture was to cover a broader class of devices. So not just focusing on mobile phones, but also small objects which you might interact with from the other side of the room, like light switches, music players, thermostats, that sort of thing. So in the first study, we found that users performed with, I think it's 51 millimeters accuracy for those small finger movements. And the accuracy with the much larger arm movements from further away was 80 millimeters. So there wasn't that great a difference between the two. There's, there wasn't any reason we made that switch. That's just part of the design to cover those. But yeah, the accuracy was similar. Right, but if I walk into a room and the thermostat's blowing at me and the speakers are blowing at me, yeah, and yeah. So, have you thought through that side of it as well? So, do you mean in terms of the obtrusiveness so of. Yeah, when they're distracting versus. Yeah. Yeah, so the one thing, we, in this, it was just interacting with the one device. So, you know, something I'd like to do in future is actually have multiple devices there showing those animations at the same time and seeing if those competing animations would be distracting and affect the input. Research from psychomotor studies on sensory motor synchronization, which is moving in times with basically LED animations like this, suggest that distractors have a small but not not much of a noticeable effect on that. So I would guess that it wouldn't be a problem, but I think that research still needs to be done. Okay. So thank, our speaker. thank you.